So we're in your government book in chapter eight, section three, and we're going to be talking about the Supreme Court. We've been talking about the judicial branch and the Supreme Court being a major part of this branch. So the Supreme Court is the highest tribunal of the United States. And of course, it is mandated by Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution. But it's at mercy of Congress because Congress determines how many justices the Supreme Court has. And the Congress also, the Senate and the Congress, actually, after the president appoints these justices, um, the Senate needs to confirm this. Since 1869, there have been eight justices plus one chief justice equals nine, right? Nine. Before 1869, there were only five. But since then, we've had, right now, we have eight justices plus one a chief justice. So there's, there's nine. Remember that number. And um, they review uh, 100 cases of the 10,000 cases per, per year. So um, they're very picky about which cases that they will review, and we'll get into that. The Supreme Court um, possesses both original and appellate jur jur jurisdiction. So what does that mean? Here, let's look at this picture. Well, before we get into that, here are some of the chief justices of the Supreme Court through, um, through the years. And we said in 1789, we have John Jay, being the first uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, on to, um, as you go, John Marshall, that is a very famous, during the times of John Adams, we'll be talking about him in the 1801 to 1835. One thing about them, remember, they're appointed for life, once they're appointed. And going through here, you'll see all of these names all the way down, they've gone down to John G. Roberts, in um, 2005 as the Chief Justice and under um, George W. Bush. So you see here, these are appointments by Washington, Adams, President Jackson, Lincoln appointed um, one, um, Grant, um, Harding, Hoover, you know, um, FDR, Roosevelt, you can see their names here. Earl Warren, this is, a, this is another famous one, very liberal type judge, and we'll learn more about him too. Both Warren and Berger, are very um, liberal, I should say, liberal judges, and they have a liberal, um, uh, basically, interpretation of the Constitution. So we'll see that. And we go down here, Reagan appointing a very conservative guy and we, as, we go, as we go on. But you see the appointments, and these are the years served as the chief justices. So... Uh, yeah, before we go on to, let's talk about the Supreme Court building here. Very famous. It was completed. Our Supreme Court building was uh, completed in 1935. So that's, you know, um, not too long ago, you know, compared to, to some of the older buildings. And it's, it was in this Greek style, even though I don't like the Greek style. It says it, it actually is patterned after the, the, um, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which is the Temple of Artemis or Diana at Ephesus. Hmm, you know, but anyway, I don't know why they actually made it like that, but it is. The words equal, ju equal justice under law are carved above the entrance of the doors. And the doors are these big bronze doors and everything's in marble. Um, and it cost, you know, babes, just the marble itself or like $3 million worth of marble. And so the court cost... Um, Nine, our estimated cost was $9,740,000, and um, it actually cost less, and they got some money back on their deal of that. The most prominent feature of the court chamber is the raised bench, you see there. And um, this raised bench is where um, the justices sit during the sessions of the court, and the bench and all the furniture in the court are crafted out of mahogany. The drapes and the coverings are very dark red, has bronze railings around it. And the most significant thing about the Supreme Court, I think, is that uh, it has a bench, as a tablet above, uh, or a tableau, they say it above, above, of the Ten Commandments that are had, uh, sculptured with figures on each side of the Ten Commandments. And this um, depicts the majesty of law and the power of government. 
and actually it tells me that, that the Supreme Court and the government relates to the Bible. And so they still have it. I know um, during time they're threatened to take these to the Ten Commandments down, but they, but praise the Lord, they haven't. That actually has to do with the law, right? So um, now let's go on here. The Supreme Court possesses both original and appellant jur jurisdiction. Um, so what does that mean? It means they see original cases, cases that just come to them. There's not as many original cases. Most of the cases that come to them to the Supreme Court are appeals. And that's why you call it appellate jurisdiction. That um, basically people have appealed to the Supreme Court or appealed to um, to um, from a district court to the appellate courts and on to the Supreme Court. So they take a lot of appeals, appellate. Jurisdiction, all jurisdiction means what cases do they take? What cases are they dictated? Jurisdiction. So, so they take original and appellant. Um, Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution grants the Supreme Court uh, original jurisdiction in two types of cases. There's only two types of cases. One is the case involved in certain people like ambassadors and diplomats. They always have to go to the Supreme Court. And then those involving a state. And they will go on to the Supreme Court. But there's very few, like I said, uh, because they don't have a lot of cases with ambassadors and diplomats and, and states. So most of the cases that they see are appeals to them from the appellant jurisdiction. And these um, basically are coming from the highest state courts and on um, to the, or either from the highest state courts or different appellate courts. They're appealing to one court, then appealing to another court, all the way up to the Supreme Court. So now let's talk about this judicial review. This is actually pretty important. So the Supreme Court serves as an interpreter of the Constitution. That's what judicial review means, is that the Supreme Court um, has to interpret the Constitution and see if that law or or that situate in that situation, if it, the Constitution applies, right? If it's constitutional or unconstitutional, that's that's actually what they were um, actually um, put through the Constitution to do, right? So judicial review again is the right to interpret law, the right of a court to declare a law or an action based upon that law as unconstitutional. So they can declare a law and say, this law is not constitutional. It does not work, right? It does not go by the Constitution. That's judicial review. Just remember that. What is judicial review? It's to declare a law if a law is um, constitutional or unconstitutional. So this case here uh, set forth what judicial, rule, uh, judicial review is all about. And so Chief Justice John Marshall... Um, basically set forth the right of judicial review in a court case. And this was in 1803, so a long time ago, we're talking about, you know, in the beginning. There was a court case uh, called Marbury versus Madison. And so um, Marshall wrote the court. It is emphatically the providence or the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is a law repugnant to the Constitution is void. So he was saying, we need to say what the law is. Is it repugnant? Is it against the Constitution? If it is against the Constitution, that law should be void, right? So let's, let me talk about the Marbury case. This whole era, this whole, this is Chief Justin John Marshall himself when he, and he took the case with Marbury versus Madison because this is a precedent case that set forth um, about what is constitution and what is not constitution. This whole page is actually about it. So I'm just going to sum it up for you. So the uh, president at that time was John Adams, and he had lost the, the re-election bid to Thomas Jefferson in 1800. So Thomas Jefferson was coming in to be president, and John Adams was leaving. That's between... John Adams was the second president, and Thomas Jefferson was the third. 
And so Adams then sought to what they call pack the court. So basically he thought to pick the judges that he could with, or, or um, I should say the judicial department with the Federalists, and to pack them with Federalists. He, um, John Adams was a Federalist. That was his party. We don't have Federalists today. But um, Thomas Jefferson was a Democratic Republican. And so he sought to pack the court's system with judges that were Federalist judges. And so one way, he actually created more judge positions so she could put more judges in. So um, this would be prior to Jefferson taking out. So Adams created and appointed judges, um, and the Senate approved them. And so then John Adams signed their commissions, and um, he gave the Secretary of State, who also would become that Chief Justice, that was that Chief Justice John Marshall, to deliver. So Marshall delivered all but 17 of the commissions, and they were left at the incoming Secretary of State to deliver. And so Thomas Jefferson heard about this. He's coming in, and he said, these were like midnight appointments. You know, they're packing the courts before I even become president. So he ordered um, his Secretary of State, which was then James Madison. James Madison would become the fourth president. Anyway, James Madison not to deliver these the remainder of these Federalists and give them their jobs. So William Marbury was one of those appointings. He was a Federalist and he was supposed to be getting his job. Well, he, um, basically he told, um, told um, uh, Madison not to um, give him his job, you know, um, not, to, not to let him serve as the Justice of Peace of District, District of Columbia. He was hired. And so he's hired, but then his job was taken away. And so he put forth a lawsuit um, against, you know, um, Madison, against, against them taking away his job. And the lawsuit requested that the Supreme Court issue a, what's called a writ of mandamus. Let's see if we have it written here. So you know, right down here, writ of mandamus right here. And the writ of mandamus is just an order that's actually making the person obey something. So this was a power given to the Supreme Court by the Judicial Act of 1789, this writ of mandamus. They have the power to say, yes, you have to do this. So the writ was by the, the court would force Madison that he'd have to deliver this job, this commission to Marbury. So he um, basically um, issued that. And so the Chief Justice John Marshall ruled that John Madison should have delivered, should deliver the commission to Marbury and to the others too. So they were given that writ to do that. So in the midst of all this, the most important part of this whole story is that Marshall then said to the Supreme Court afterwards, you know, said to the Supreme Court towards the end of what he, he was saying, yes, I'm getting, you know, he needs to do this. He needs to give him this job, but um, he doesn't have to. He doesn't really have the power to compel Madison to deliver commission because of the Judiciary Act, which granted the power of the writ of mandamus to the Supreme Court was unconstitutional. So he said, yes, he should do this, do this writ of mandamus, but this, the writs are unconstitutional. So he said he was declaring that it was unconstitutional for for unconstitutional. Even though he told him to do it, he said it was unconstitutional. By stating that Congress did not have the power to give the writ of mandamus, Marshall gave the court the right of having the final say on the constitutional matters. So he said, no, a writ of mandamus is unconstitutional. And so the power then of judicial review was that he had declared it unconstitutional gives the Supreme Court its most important tool in checking and balancing Congress is to declare if a law is unconstitutional. So it's kind of a long deal about the whole thing, but that's how it came to be for judicial review. So the power of judicial review gives the Supreme Court its most important tool in checking and balancing Congress and the president. Judicial review is the Supreme Court's most important job. So remember that, judicial review. So the legal road to the Supreme Court. So let's talk about this. 
the principal way um, for um, a court case to come through is to appeal the matter of writ of centoriae. Sen centioriary. I can't say it. Let's say it. Let's say it. I pronounced it wrong. In fact, it's pronounced sure shiratoria. Sir, she rari. Huh. Ah, see if I pronounce that. I, I am not familiar with this one. Writ of um, sir, she rari. Sir, she rari. And we just call it cert. That's how come I don't really know how to say it because this is a Latin word that was made made for more certain. And they call it just cert for cert. Okay, the writ of cert. Let's just call it the writ of cert since I'm not pronouncing it correctly. And it's a, um, basically is a petition for the court to hear a case. The writ of cert, they can hear the case. So the writ of cert um, made more certain, it's called, and 10% um, of the Supreme Court cases came by appeals. And the court must review the case when and when the um, party that has the right of uh, appeal comes through. They have the writ of, of cert, which means basically that they can um, hear, they can re appeal the case to the Supreme Court. So let's just, let me just read this, what it says here. It says, only about 10% of the Supreme Court cases come by appeals. Technically, when the aggrieved party um, has the right of appeal, the court must review the case. The one who appeals a case is called the appellant. So appeal, somebody that appeals is called the appellant. And most cases which are appealed as a matter of right are rejected for want of substantial federal question or on other jurisdictional grounds. So most of the cases that are appealed to the Supreme Court are rejected. Just to know that. There's not very many cases that they take. Since 1988, the Supreme Court has been given almost complete control over deciding which cases they will hear. And this power is to decide whether it would hear a case is called discretionary review. So this is another definition. Discretionary review basically says, is, is the Supreme Court going to hear the case or not? Are they going to they have a discretion that they can say, no, we don't want to hear it. Or they can say, yes, we will hear this case as the cases are appealed to them. So um, most of the cases decided by the Supreme Court come to the court by means of discretionary writ of centoria, usually called cert. Discre uh, discretionary writ of cert. That's what we're going to call it. <laughs> Uh, so, in all these cases involved a substantial federal question in which the right of appeal does not exist, the party sustaining an adverse decision from the lower court has the privilege of petitioning the Supreme Court for uh, centuria, a writ of, centur or writ of cert, right? Just think of writ of cert. It's easy ways to remember that. So, um... The one who petitions a court to review the decision of a lower court court is called a petitioner. So a petitioner is the one is that's petitioning the Supreme Court to hear their case. And the court can decide whether or not to grant the petition without even stating the reason. They can say, okay, we're not gonna hear your case. They don't even need to tell you. So for the court to hear the case, in fact, four of the nine justices have to agree to grant the petition for the case and say, yes, we'll hear it. So you can see most petitions and the writs of uh, century are, are, are granted. Not all of them are granted, only very few. Most of them are not granted, is what I should say. Indeed, the Supreme Court agrees to review only about 2%. They only go, so the Supreme Court only takes about 2% of those large volume of cases that are coming to it on a petition for the writ of uh, cert. So writ of cert, cert is coming through and only about 2%, 2% of the cases are taken. Okay, let's talk about a court in session. What's it look like? So, well, the Supreme Court 
sits in session for nine months out of the year, um, starting on the first Monday in October and ends at the end of June. So it's a 36 week term and it's divided with hearing cases and writing of opinions. So basically they're gonna hear the case and then they're gonna write opinions about the case. So it's kind of divided there. The opinions are delivered by um, an assembled court on the first on the, on the Tuesday and Wednesdays is when they do that. That's when they do their opinions on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Um, and Mondays are the oral arguments they're listening to that have to do with the case. So um, let's talk about when they open, when they open the ceremony. So the opening ceremonies, and I'm just going to read part of this because it kind of shows the picture here instead of me going over the whole thing. The entry of the justices into the courtroom is, is fittingly dramatic. It's very dramatic. At the hour appointed by the court to hear oral arguments, the red drapes in the, in the courtyard part and the chief justice enters the room followed by the eight associate justices in order of their seniority. The justices are seated behind a raised and half hexagon shaped bench in a, in high backed swivel chairs against a background of the full red draperies. The Chief Justice occupies the center chair. The Senior Associate Justice sits to his immediate right, and then the second senior to his left, and so on, alternating right and left, which one's a senior. At the sound of the gavel, all in the courtroom, including the justices, arise and remain standing until the completion of the crier's chant. So what does the crier chant? Basically this, the Honorable the Chief Justice and the Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attentions for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. <laughs> So it's pretty, it's, it's pretty dramatic, needless to say. So that's the opening. The oral arguments. Um, the oral arguments are heard on Monday through Thursday, two weeks of each month. And the justices have already had the opportunity to study the case. They know all about the case. And they read over the copies of the briefs from the lawyers and they're filed in the court well in advance so they can look it over way before um, they have to they go have to bring it into court. So this word, so um, the the amicus carere, amicus carere. Basically, what is that? Well, basically, that is um, because there's a lot of different people that may have um, opposing attorneys and such involved in the case, um, but they may be a friend of the court. Actually, this word, amicus uh, means, amicus means friend, and carere, carere means court, so it means friend of the court. So, and these are friends of the court, they call them, and they're filed by individuals who are, are not parties in the case, but they have a very, um, strong interest in the case's outcome, like controversial issues like abortion and prayer in schools and these kinds of things. You're going to have these amicus curares there saying they have, they are listening and they are very interested as um, filing these in the copies of briefs and finding out um, these um, additional materials. So they know that there's much interest in the outcome of this case. So just think of amicus curare or briefs that may offer to the court um, by other people, friends of the court, they say. So, um, and of course, a lot of cases that go to the Supreme Court are controversial cases. 
So the lawyers presenting the arguments before the court under a lot of pressure. In fact, <laughs> they only have a certain amount of time, you know, so, um, and the time period they have to present their, their case is only 30 minutes and it's very sharply monitored. A white light comes on when five minutes are left and the red light says, stop. They have to stop immediately, stop talking. So, and then the justices in, and they are also are free to interpret or interrupt. They can, of course, they're gonna interpret, but um, they're gonna interrupt. They can interrupt the lawyers and ask them questions anytime they want. So they can stop them anytime they want and ask them questions. So, um, in fact, there was a former solicitor um, um, whose name was General Stanley Reed. He once fainted while he was arguing before the court because it was it's so much pressure to come before um, in the Supreme Court, you know, as as a um, lawyer in the Supreme Court and to speak for this time is a is a takes a, a lot of pressure and anxiety. Let's just say that. So now let's talk about the Solicitor General. So who is the Solicitor General? So the task of representing the United States before the Supreme Court falls on the Solicitor General. This is a very strong position. In fact, they also call it the, the fourth ranking member of the Justice Department because he, he basically can, um, he has a very unique relationship and he can really, um, to show what kinds of cases the Supreme Court will heal, um, hear, and he can also um, strategically choose those cases for him. So he's really, he's re it's a really important job. Um, it says here, the Solicitor General is the fourth ranking member of the Justice Department and has been called the court's ninth and a half member. You know, there's nine nine justices and he's like the half member because of his unique relationship to the court. He is likely to know what kinds of cases the Supreme Court will agree to hear. Therefore, he can choose those cases that, that he believes the court will hear and that he believes can win. So what a big job that he can actually choose which courses, courts, uh, cases will go through the courts. So uh, more than Often than not, the court grants the Solicitor General his petition to have the government's case heard before the court. Because of this special relationship with the court and his great experience in arguing before the court, the Solicitor General usually has a high rate of success when arguing cases. So Solicitor General, just know that's important because they have the task that kind of tells who is going to be heard and what cases um, will po possibly be won by the court. So conferences, the conferences. So each Friday um, during the court's term, the justices meet in the conference area and then they come on Fridays. Fridays are days to get together, right? Just them, just the justices. And they give their conference handshake. The tradition since the late 19th um, century, they shake the hands of all the other eight justices. And then um, they basically um, will all get along, even though, basically it's the same, we're all gonna get along, even though we have a lot of um, different opinions on things. It produces a harmony, like we're all gonna get along. And uh, the, ju the junior justice basically is next to the door. And so anybody that comes to the door during this time, the junior justice is the one, the one that's the youngest, not youngest, I should say, the one that's been there the least years must answer the door every time the messages are brought. In fact, one of the, the justices, um, Tom Clark, sat near the door um, for five years. He was the, he was the, um, the, the uh, he was also the youngest, but he was also that justice that was considered the junior justice. And he said, I have the highest pay, I'm the highest paid doorkeeper in the world <laughs> because he had answered the door so many years, five years. So traditionally, the chief justice starts the conference by giving his view of the case. So the chief justice gives his view 
and then he's followed by each of these other justices in the order of seniority on what they think. And each justice must be prepared to present his view of the case at this time. If he has strong convictions about the issue involved, he must prepare to argue. So, um, so the Chief Justice starts out, here's some pictures of the Chief Justice in 2010, of course is the middle position, and then you'll see um, each to the right, and um, as you see from seniority to the right. But anyway, here's here, this picture here though, um, they're all posing for, for a photograph. They don't usually sit just like that, but. Oh, okay, so <clears throat> the chairman of the conference um, the, basically sets the agenda for the discussion, the chief justice for the discussion by focusing on the points of the case that he thinks are most important. And um, because the court's um, caseload is so large, it's up to the chief justice to keep the conference moving on while attempting to maintain peace and harmony among the justices. That's what the chief justice does. So... So that position calls for a person demonstrating both effective leadership and sound reasoning in law, right? After the discussion on Friday, they're all getting together to discuss. Each justice votes on the case. Um, there's a quorum of six justices needed for the court to hear the case. Six of them have to say, yes, we're going to hear the case. Um, although all nine will participate, there has to be at least six that, that want to hear the case. Um, a simple majority of those present is required to order um, a case to be decided. So um, that's what they need to do. So the opinion. Okay, let's talk about the opinion. So what's the opinion? The opinion as Supreme Court, well, ever since the days of Justice John Marshall, Marshall in 1801, to 1835, the opinion of the Supreme Court has followed the practice of issuing written opinions where they may render the decision. So each justice has write out his opinion. There are four different kinds of opinions that they can put down. First, they can have a unanimous opinion. What's a unanimous opinion? It means that all justices agree on the case and say, yes, we all agree. Um, and about 33, about one third of the cases, they all agree. And they all have a unanimous opinion on it. Then there's the majority opinion. And this is also called a court opinion. And the majority opinion um, is when it's split on the issues, but a majority, um, the justice votes the majority. So the majority means the, the majority is of that opinion. So the majority so opinion, and then there's the concurring opinion. If a justice votes with the majority, but wishes to explain his reasoning in a separate opinion saying, yes, I vote for the majority, but this is my opinion on it. It's called a concurring opinion. So we have the unanimous opinion, we have the majority opinion, and we have a concurring opinion. The last is the di dissenting opinion, and that's basically, um, only the only justice who does not vote with the majority, it's only the justices who do not vote for the majority on a case and they write their dissenting opinion, why they don't agree for this case. So they're pretty easy. One's unanimous opinion, everybody has the same opinion. Majority opinion means the majority have, have that opinion, you know, and they write together in the majority. And there's concurring opinion, basically, they have, uh, have the, the majority opinion, but they want to add to the opinion why they're voting that way um, to show what they really think. They voted that way, but maybe there is an issue. And then on to the dissenting opinion, that's when they disagree. So four different types of opinions. Opinion writing um, is very important to the decision rendered. Because even um, when you think, um, okay, in the case of majority opinions, if the chief justice is in, is in the majority, he may write the opinion himself or he may assign opinion to another justice that voted with the majority. When the chief justice is in the majority, the senior justice 
of the majority assigns a member of the majority to write the majority opinion. The opinions are just very important. The opinion writing stage is so important to the decision rendered because everyone's looking about why, uh, um, why are they void voting on the case in this, in this way. They want to know the opinions of the judges. So even though a vote has been taken on each case during the conference, any member of the court can reverse his opinion. So while the court's in session, they can say, I decided not to have that opinion. So on opinion day, when opinion day comes, they have to have it done. Opinion day marks the final stage of the Supreme Court decision. Um, and the justices themselves present the opinion. Um, each one pre presents their own opinion. This is a very solemn public session. So the, the world's looking on and the opinions are summarized and announced to the public orally. And this is a characteristic mark of the United States Supreme Court is issuing their opinions. So here's, here's, the, here's a, in brief, the road from case to court opinion. So we have, um, see how the federal courts and the state courts, how, how many cases they take, request and then discussed in conference, review and denied, you know, which ones are, and you can see the rule of, of um, discuss the docket, approximately 100 cases, you know, briefs, oral arguments, conference, and then they do their opinion. So they get together and they take how many cases um, to review, discretionary review, and then they give the lawyers give their briefs on these cases, then they give their oral, oral arguments on these cases, then they have a conference on the case, and then the judges give their opinions. So see how they do. I went over all of this. So I'm going to stop and we'll finish up this last part in the next video because I'm getting kind of long here. So.